Well, good afternoon. How are you guys doing? I'm, I'm used to people getting up and stirring around when, when the word mobile home park is mentioned, so uh, I'm just I'm grateful you stayed. So I also recognize full well that I'm the last person uh, before lunch, so uh, this better be good. Um, so a couple of things. My, my focus for the time that we are here together is not to tell you a lot about what we do, because you're not here, um, I don't presume, to learn more about us. You're uh, hopefully here to take things that you can use and apply in your own life in different ways. And so my aim is to take some of the things that I've learned over the years that I've done what I've done and um, share them in the hopes that it, it helps you uh, do what you guys are doing. So in terms of, uh, I'll start with this, just part of our conversation is going to uh, delve into a little bit of what we do. We have an open vehicle uh, currently and raising right now, so I have to put this up that any, any contemplation of um, anything having to do with a fund for accredited investors only, read the PPM, their risks, consider them, uh, all of those things. All right, so now that that's done, I'll give you a little bit of a background just so you know where we're coming from, where I'm coming from, and then I'm going to delve into to some things that I will say on the surface seem very, very simple, um, but how many of you realized in your life that sometimes powerful things start with really simple beginnings? And so I, I will say some of what I'm going to share with you is simple. Um, but it's not, uh, it's not easy, um, and so, but it's very, very valuable. If I were to give you uh, the best pieces of advice that I could, I'm gonna give those today. So I'm gonna walk you through that in just a second. But just to give you a little bit of a background, um, i from Orlando, Florida. And I started a tech company when I was 13 years old. I write software. I know when I walked up here, you knew I was a coder. You just looked at me and said, that guy's a coder. Um, so started a bunch of software uh, companies uh, when I was young. Uh, my dad was a real estate investor. He's ADD, ADHD, one of the smartest men I've ever met. Uh, the challenge he had, if you ever know anybody who's ADD and ADHD, is they struggle with numbers, um, especially ADD and ADHD. He never took the time to do the numbers, and when he did, they moved backwards, you know, because he, he was off this way. Okay. Um, he did say something years ago that I still chuckle about. He said, the benefit or the blessing of dyslexia is that the word no has always turned me on, which um, I, I give you a little peek at that my dad's personality. So, Anyway, um, with that being said, when I was young, I would help my dad do his financial modeling, his forecasting, his cash on cash returns, all of his financial projections, uh, because he wasn't very good at it. So as a teenager, I said, you know what, my dad has to have a tool that does this for him. So I sat down over a summer and coded an application that helped him with his analytics. Ended up building a software application that had about 140,000 real estate investors worldwide using it. Um, built that all the way into my um, early 20s, sold it. Uh, that company and parlayed it into real estate. Um, I also played baseball. I'm 6'8", to, okay, well, I'm not going to say the way it's changed over the years. Um, many years ago, people said, hey, you um, play basketball. Um, a couple years ago, it was football, and I'm, I'm trending uh, in the wrong direction. So um, with respect to that, I got drafted professionally uh, a couple of times for, for baseball, so I chose to buy mobile home parks instead. Um, basically, that's the summation. So, when I started buying real estate, we, uh, my wife and I, who started the company Elevation, we had cash, we had credit, we knew real estate was a good place to play, um, and we had the software tool that I had built for my, for my dad's business. Um, right off the bat, we had started buying single family residential um, with a with goal of long term old. Uh, the challenge we ran into, we bought about 25 houses in our early 20s, um, but we found out it wasn't scalable. I don't know if anybody's been to that point in, in your business, but we said, okay, once you get 20 houses, you should, your margin should thicken, your management should be more effective, some of these things. And we found, at least where we were investing, that wasn't the case. And so we looked for a better way to do things. And so we spent about a year in our early 20s, and all we did is evaluate pretty much every type of, of real estate imaginable. And we were looking for four things. We were looking for cash flow, we were looking for capital appreciation, the ability to invest a dollar and have it grow into more over time. You know, I think everybody has that as a goal. We wanted tax efficiency, and we wanted non-correlation. I know, and I'll just talk about the elephant in the room, I think everybody in this room is probably considering, well, what's around the corner economically? Is there gonna be a, a recession? Is it gonna be a crisis? There's, you know, that just seems to be looming in a lot of our conversations. But in short, I wanted to invest in something that historically has not been on the same roller coaster ride as, every, every, as everything else in the market, what is called a low beta investment. And so the two that we found that were the most compelling were mobile home parks and self-storage. 
Now, I, I mentioned mobile home parks. They're also called manufactured housing communities. Uh, they're also called trailer parks. It's, it's all the same thing. So feel free to use those words interchangeably. But one of the things I found early on in my business, and I'll just I'll share this really quickly, um, is is this one of the things I loved about mobile home parks right off the bat, and it jumped off the funny page, jumped off the page from an analytical standpoint, was the mode. So fast track to today, the first question we we ask ourselves on anything that we invest in or buy is is that asset moated? Are there barriers to entry? Is there a walled garden? So now going back in time, when I first started in, in the mobile home park business and started to consider it, what I found laying in plain sight was a free moat. And let me describe what I mean by that really quickly. So if I were to ask everybody in the room, and maybe I'll do it just really quickly, just for fun, how many of you like or prefer Coke? Coca-Cola products to Pepsi. I'll just, those are the two options. You gotta pick Pepsi or Coke. Okay, so how many of you like Coke? Okay, how many of you like Pepsi? Okay, so there's, there's a blend, right? Now, here's something interesting. Did you know those two companies have spent nearly a trillion dollars to get you to respond one way or the other? And the history of the business is they've spent almost a trillion dollars in marketing to influence your response when I ask you a question, right? In favor or not, right? And so by just a quick visualization, they're only 50% effective in this population after spending a trillion dollars. <laughs> right? Okay, so now, question. How many of you would prefer to not have a mobile home park built right across the street from your house? Raise your hand. Okay, I haven't spent a dollar and I have more <laughs> Now the interesting thing is, I, I'm a, it, it's funny, but I actually was amazed at this in my early 20s because I thought I saw a free moat lying in plain sight. Now most people think of moats, well it has to be positive. You have to feel positively for it to be a moat. That's not true. The simple fact is mobile home parks are needed everywhere, they're not allowed anywhere because they're hated everywhere. Okay, and interestingly enough, we've never met before, and your feeling against mobile home parks near you have protected our capital for years, and so I do need to say thank you. I also want to say, if at the end of this conversation you say, this is the worst talk I've ever heard, I hated everything the guy said, all I would ask you to do is to tell everybody, and please speak loudly, because you're perpetuating the stigma, which actually is value to the industry. Does that make sense? Okay, a lot of industries you have to worry about new supply and competition with mobile home parks, you don't. And that's the value. So we started buying mobile home parks um, many, many years ago. We built a business, and we now have a, somewhat of a large business. So we continue to grow it. It's been a lot of fun. We also invest in storage. There's a lot of similarities between the two. Um, in terms of our team, we have a very experienced management team. So not only do we underwrite the deals, we handle deal flow, we do the financing, we do the property management, we do everything in-house. We have a national focus we currently own in 30 states. Um, and like I said, mobile home parks. These are a brand, so for storage, everything's under Mini-U, uh, Mini-U storage. And then mobile home parks are under JRV. There's three principals, my wife and I are two of the three, uh, Jamie, Ryan, and then the third is Brian. So in short, if we won't put our name on it, we won't own it. Um, so we own, um, the quality of our properties are much nicer than you would imagine uh, when I mentioned mobile home parks. Uh, I'll show you a video in a minute just so you can kind of get a sense for what we're doing. So for the time that we're together, I think this is, this is something I thought could add value. Um, I hope that it does, I hope that it's helpful. I hope it gives you a different lens to look at things through. Um, and so in short, I want to talk about the difference between cash flow versus the value of cash flow. Sounds like the same. Um, the reason I say this is today, a lot of investors that I meet, they're really focused on cash flow. And this is kind of the narrative that I hear. I work a job nine to five doing X, Y, Z. I'd really like to take my capital and invest it in such a way where I generate enough cash flow from my passive investment so I don't have to actively work. That, that is, I hear that all the time. And maybe that's for you, maybe it's not. The, the, short, the short summation here is this. It's a fine goal. I had that goal many, many years ago. I think there's something maybe to consider or add to your consideration that could be helpful. Because in short, it's nearly impossible, the way the IRS is structured, it's nearly impossible to earn yourself rich. Okay? It's nearly impossible to earn through income, i.e. cash flow, yourself wealthy. However, if you look at it in a different way, cash flow can actually be a leverage point or a mechanism to create wealth, and from wealth you can generate all the income you want. So wealth creates income, you can't create wealth from income. Does that make sense? Anyway, I'll, I'll go through it really quickly. So cash flow versus the value of cash flow. 
I'm going to briefly go through why Milwaukee Parks and self-storage in case you're um, curious about each asset class. Um, our preferred strategy, some things we've learned along the way, uh, and then we'll go from there. So base understanding as I get into this, um, so there's several different ways to value a property. Just to fast track to it, we value property based on the income model. It's a, it's a multiple of income. And more specifically, something called net operating income. So NOI, this is the gross revenue of a property minus all operating expenses, but not including financing. So the four financing is, is considered. So um, gross income minus operating expenses is NOI. So capitalization rate is, in, in, many, in many ways, capitalization rate is the real estate equivalent of a, of a price for earnings multiple, if you're familiar with, you know, kind of a, a, a publicly traded company, right? A company, work, a company earns X dollars, so it trades for X times whatever that multiple is. Well, the same thing with real estate. Capitalization rate is, is to a degree a multiplier, um, although it's a little tricky, real estate does it a little bit different in that it's a, it's a fraction. Uh, and I'll, just, I'll discuss this in just a second. So the possible value of an asset, not necessarily what it'll sell for, because as we all know, sometimes a property is worth X and it sells for more than X or less than X. But in short, a possible value for an asset is the net operating income of the asset divided by whatever that market capitalization rate is. Okay? So with that base understanding, and this is, by the way, this is really, this is not fun, and I can tell by your face you are pretty if you're looking at this like, this is, this is terrible, I'd rather eat a sandwich right now. And, but this is the base for what we're going to build on, and I promise it gets, I hope, well, I don't promise, it's fun for me. So we'll, we'll, get, we'll get into that right now. So somebody who has a cash flow only perspective, I just want to compare and contrast the two perspectives. Somebody who's only buying assets for cash flow, I'm going to keep it simple to say, let's say you buy an asset and in, Month one, you add a dollar of NOI, okay? Because every time we buy a property, we're trying to find a way to make it make more money, right? Because if your goal is cash flow, you want it to make more. So let's say per dollar of net operating income, so you buy a property, whatever type, it could be mobile home park, storage, duplex, triplex. So you add a dollar of NOI monthly, which is $12 of NOI yearly. After taxes, because your tax, let's just assume that ordinary income, it's not, let's say it's not through an EQRP program or these other ways you could go. Um, but let's just say it's ordinary income, you have $7 of after tax profit, okay, on that cash flow, right? So $1 a month is $7 in your pocket. Now let's compare that to this different way of looking at things. So if the value of an asset is a function of NOI, $1 of NOI monthly is $12 a year at a 5% cap rate. Now, I'm not going to go much into this. There's a whole discussion here. Maybe you're targeting properties that are valued at 10% cap rate, which is a lower multiple uh, per the same NOI, um, usually because there's some risk associated with that asset. But valued at a 5% cap rate, which is a 20 time multiple, okay? divide something by 0.05, it multiplies it by 20, which is why it's a PE equivalent, it's a multiplier. So if you have $12 of NOI, every dollar of monthly NOI is worth $240 in equity. Now, question, how much tax do you pay on unrealized gains? Zero. So it's $240 compared to seven. Now, I've, I've realized this in my own life. Um, I, I had this view at one point. But I think we've all, in, at some point in our life, looked at somebody else who looks like they do things a lot easier. They don't work as hard. And we all think to ourselves, there must be something they know that I don't know. But we don't know what that one thing is. Anybody ever been there? Or you're working harder, they're achieving more. So what's the delta? In most cases, in many cases, they understand the difference between cash flow and the value of cash flow. Okay? So in short here, for every dollar, and I'm going to go into more exercises here, just I'm going to expand this out, but for every dollar of monthly NOI, it's roughly a 5% cap rate, $240 in your pocket. Now, for those of you who understand this, there's a small little wrinkle, and it's kind of ironic. If you're, if you're looking for more cash flow, so here's a question. If you're wanting more cash flow, do you generally buy higher cap rate assets or lower cap rate assets? Higher, which would mean at a 10% cap, that would be 120. So you have to choose. What do you want, cash flow or value? Because if you chase cash flow, you're going to generally play in a space with higher cap rates, therefore lower value for every dollar you create. 
I, there's a more dynamic conversation we can have here. But in short, here's the point. Every single day, our job is to find dollars. Why, why is it important to find dollars? Question, if, if I said, hey, for every dollar you find, it's worth $240 to you, how many of you would go to a property every single day and look for ways to find dollars? Okay, because that's a lot. $240 of tax-free, or it's not taxed at that time because it's not, it's not realized. Now, I've had people say, well, okay, it's only 240. Well, first, if you think $1 worth 240 is only, then that's something, that's another seminar. That's, going on. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's thrilling to me, okay? Uh, now, the other thing people will say is, yeah, I get that, but it's unrealized. So how can I ever, well, very simple, very simple. How can you realize without paying tax that you refinance. If you have an increase in value, can you use leverage? Let's say you put 60% leverage on that 200, which is fairly low leverage, 60% on the 240, which is what? About $150. So if you take out $150 from a loan, loan proceeds, how much tax do you pay on the 150? How much tax do you pay on borrowing? Zero. So I have 150 of tax, of money that I don't pay tax on in my account still versus the 70, plus I still have 90 in unrealized gain. Does that make sense? So there, there's all kinds of things here. So let's, let's move on and progress, and then we'll, we'll get into a couple of examples. Okay, so this is the, the thing I kind of just went through. Which do you value more, a dollar that is worth seven or a dollar that's worth 240? Do you understand why? You have to, which dollar do you want? Well, we all want this, but interestingly enough, I've noticed most people actually want this, but focus on this. This is the plan they're executing, yet this is what they want. Okay, so just really simple. All right, so what if is, this is a most good thing to start with what if, so I borrow, let's say what if. So let's say you have um, a dollar of NOI monthly, two, uh, two units, still valued at 5% cap, okay? So if $1 a month is 240, okay, what is, what is 10? What's it on 10 units? $2,400, okay? So what if you have 100 units? So every one dollar is twenty-four thousand. Right? What if you have a thousand units? Every one dollar is two hundred and forty thousand. Now, if you have a thousand units, how how excited are you to find the dollars? Yeah. Well, you should be as excited as the ten. It's all relative. Does that make sense? That's why big things come from small beginnings. So, for those of you who want, this is just staggering to me. If you have a thousand units and you want to increase your net worth by a quarter million dollars in a year, you find a buck. Find a buck. Find a dollar, right? So now question, if that dollar is so valuable to you, do you have a property management infrastructure where you, you turn it over to somebody else trusting that they're gonna find those dollars or do you actually visit your own properties looking for dollars? We visit all of our properties, why? Because I like looking for dollars. I'll give you a quick example. We have a storage facility in uh, Palm Bay, Florida. Uh, we have many, but we have one in Palm Bay. Uh, we were walking, so we do. We visit every site we have in the in the country. We physically walk them as owners at least twice a year. We have regional managers, and we have a whole infrastructure, but we also walk our properties. But we were walking on the second floor of the storage facility uh, to the elevator, and there was a ten by ten open space that just allowed a lot of people wide berth to access the elevator. But there was plenty of room. But I'm looking at a ten by ten space, thinking what? Yeah. Dollars, right? There should be a there should be a locker there. Okay, so quick math. If I can if I can rent that for two hundred dollars a month, gross revenue twenty four hundred a year. Take a third for operating expense, which uh, storage is. What is that? Let's just say fifteen. I'm going to go high and let's say it's fifteen hundred dollars of NOI a year at five at 20, 20 times or five cap. What is that? That's thirty thousand dollars. So the joke is, we walked around and found $30,000 laying on the floor, <laughs> right? Because we're always looking for those dollars. Um, I can give you another example in Will in a second. Now, obviously, this is where you start saying, okay, this is all $1, right? What's the next logical question or thought? What about $2, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, pretty big, right? So $2 or three or four or five, okay. So in many properties, so for example, in mobile home parks, if you have a, a $500 a month lot rent. Now, I'll get to this later, but we don't want to own the mobile homes, we just want to own the dirt underneath them. Um, that's our model. But if the dirt costs $500 a month, do you think you could pass on a rental increase in any given year of $15 to $20 a year? Yeah, absolutely. By the way, 
yes, <laughs> that's okay if no, but, but yeah, that's fairly reasonable. In some cases you might not, in most cases you can. But the point is, $20 of NOI. So let's say you buy a property and you increase your rent, $20 or your NOI, $20 a year. Now net operating income, one other thing I'll, I'll mention here, it's net operating income. So can you generate $20 of increase by cutting expenses? Yes. Yeah. Can you also generate $20 of increase by finding other revenue streams? Yes. Like in a mobile home park, could you put in a covered parking and charge monthly for the covered parking or a shed and charge for the shed or give security systems to your tenants for free for $5 a month? All right. Why? What's $5 a month? 60 times. You see the point. So the point is there's all kinds of ways you can generate and grow in a line. Um, that's, that's where it's, it's more nuanced. But $20 of NOI monthly at 10 units is 48,000 in equity. 10 units, 100 units is half a million dollars. 1,000 units is $4.8 million. You see how it starts to grow. Now, by the way, is this lifetime or is this in one year? One year. One year. Well, I, I hate to do the pinky in the brain question, but what are we gonna do next year, pinky? <laughs> Right? You see what I'm saying? It's every single year. All right, so here's, here's the thing. Why, so based on all of this, let's start with the end of nine and work backwards. So we, we've kind of established enough where we can actually kind of go backwards. So question would be, what's your goal? What's your goal? And some of you may not have one, and that's fine. I, you know, it, it's hard to find what you're looking for if you don't know what you're looking for. But at the end of the day, what's your goal? So let's say your goal is to create $10 million of, of net worth for yourself at some point in your life, okay? Not next year, although I'm sure we all like that, but let's just say at some point in our life, right? Is that reasonable or am I, I don't know because I haven't seen, not one of you even looked up at that number, so either that's well beyond or well under your expectations. <laughs> anyway, so I'm gonna just stick with $10 million, okay? It could be five, it could be 20, you can adjust it as you need, I'm just giving an example of how you can work backwards, okay? So I'm going to give you an example. So assuming your goal is $10 million in net worth, which I think is a pretty, pretty good one, right? Here, start with this. So assuming $10 million equity goal. So at a 5% cap rate, assuming 5%, you need 500,000 of new NOI. So you need to buy property and create $500,000 of new NOI, and at 20 times, you're worth $10 million, right? But that seems like a lot of like five hundred thousand of dollars. That's five hundred thousand dollars. That's a lot of dollars. Okay. Well, let's break it down into more bite size. So on a monthly basis, it's forty-two thousand. So you need to find forty-two thousand dollars a month. You need to buy property and create forty-two thousand dollars a month of new NOI at five percent cap to be worth ten million dollars. Okay. That's a little encouraging. Forty-two thousand plus than five hundred, but it's still a lot of money. Okay. So let's kind of break it down. So what if you had a thousand units? What if your goal is to own a thousand? Now, once again. 10,000 or 100, you can modify as needed. But let's say it's 1,000. So this could be two or three mobile home parks, it could be one storage facility, it could be you know, a couple apartment companies, whatever your goal is. So 1,000 units, take this a month, divide by 1,000. So now you need you need 1,000 units, and across those 1,000 units, you need to find a way to increase in a white $42 a month. Still on the website. Okay. So, <laughs> It's, I'm going to get it down lower. And it, okay, so here, $42 a month, right? That's going to be closer. Okay, now, if you do that by next year, you have a $10 million increase in net worth. That's once again, assuming that 5% cap rate. Okay, now, how many of you would give yourself some latitude and time, knowing that all things take time? And also knowing that if you do something, if this is good for year one, it's good for year two, it's good for year three, it'll continue to be good for year 10. That's why, okay. So let's do five years. So let's give yourself five years. So at five years, you divide this by five, that's roughly $8, approximately $8 a month. So let me summarize it. If you go out and buy and acquire 1,000 units and find a way to grow NOI by $8 a month on average across all 1,000 units, and the properties are valued at roughly 5% cap rate, you've created $10 million of net worth for yourself. I, there's three kind souls that are crying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's say something. Like, Woohoo! So, yeah, yeah. yeah and, and by the way, by the way, and this may or may not be thrilling for you. I hope you can tell. It's thrilling for me. This is what I do every single day. All we are about every single day is finding dollars. 
And why is that important? Why does that matter? Well, now you know. Um, so, you know, like I said, you can go back and you can add 10,000 units and all kinds of other examples. But before I go on off of this, because it's, it's really pretty big, you understand why, if you understand this and grasp this, there are variations, there's considerations, there's cap rate understandings. Now, with that in mind, one question I get all the time, and it's a really good question if you're okay with, this is a question I get, is what happens if interest rates go up and cap rates go up, right? Because usually cap rates move and, and uh, there's a, core, a rough correlation between interest rates and cap rates. Generally, cap rates are, depending on the asset class, two to three points above whatever the prevailing interest rate is. That's a real rough general statement. But in short, if cap rates go up, what happens to my multiple? It goes down, right? So if a cap rate goes from five to 10, which you know, our storage generally goes uh, two points one way to the other, it's, it's pretty much range bound um, within a mean. So in short, but what happens if it goes from 5% to 10%? Well, at 10% cap, everything that I just did here would be worth 5 million, not 10. But the, the point in it is most people think about dynamic market conditions in a static environment. And, and let me tell you what I mean by that. So when, infl when interest rates go up, what is it typically in response to? Why do interest rates generally go up? Supply, demand, and inflation, right? It's, a, it's usually inflation that causes interest rates to go up. And what's the sign of a good business? This is Buffett 101, and all, most great investors will say this. What's the sign of a good business? the ability to pass on inflation to your customer, right? That's a, if you can't pass on inflation to your customer, if you're in an environment with inflation and your cost of goods are rising and you can't raise your prices, you're a dead man walking, right? You're out of business, you just don't know it yet, right? So you need to have a business that passes on inflation successfully to customers. And typically businesses that do are moated businesses. So back to that mode. Coca-Cola is a brand mode. If prices go up to them, what do they do? They raise their price. Okay, RC Cola can't, but Coke can because they have a brand. Anyway, long story short, the question of can I pass on increased cost to my customer is a sign of a good business. Now, historically, mobile home parks have allowed us to do that, and so has self-storage. So what do I mean by all of that? If interest rates rise and inflation, or inflation rises, so interest rates rise and cap rates rise, I now have income that is worth less. Right, my multiple is, is going down. However, if I have a good business and I can pass on inflation to my customer, what happens to my NOI? It goes up. So I have more of something worth less. So value is actually relatively unchanged. Now, who's doing, rather than going in and programmatically thinking about adding all of these things to your property to grow NOI, who's actually doing a lot of the heavy lifting and the NOI growth? Inflation. Now, how many of you have ever heard uh, in real estate, there's this saying that real estate's like a ship in the harbor. When inflation comes, the ship rises with inflation. It's a visual of des description of what I'm, I'm saying here. But the interesting thing is this, and I, and I want to share this with you because it's, it's really, I, I think, valuable. Um, in the long run, if you own real estate for the long run, which we do, we, want, we buy everything that we, every property we buy, we're willing to own for um, at least 10 to 20 years, or, or we're not going to buy it. We're, we're in it for the long haul for this reason. So if inflation comes and NOI grows, how many of you have ever heard of a Pavlovian response? Okay, so customers are now paying a higher rental rate because inflation is dictating that. They get used to paying that rental rate, and what does it become over time? Accepted market, like a $5 Coke or $3 Coke it's market, right? Now, interestingly enough, so the ship in the harbor has gone up with the tide, but interestingly enough, in real estate, historically, you can research this and find this um, and to varying degrees of true, but as inflation then moderates over time, and interest rates fall and cap rates come back down, meaning more value per NOI, do, does NOI then go down? No. Or do customers keep paying it because they're used to it? Yeah. So now you, you lever inflation to get NOI growth and then capitalize its value at a better multiple in the long run on the backside. That's why these cycles over the long run create a lot of value, but you've got to hold it. You've got to hold it. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on, but hopefully that was interesting. Let me ask a question. Let me ask, are there any questions on this before I move on? There's other things I won't go into, but before I move off of this, any, yes? So what do you do with your, I mean, do you do 
finding more dollars to that. How sustainable? I mean, do you do like TV arrays on your properties? Do you do like stuff like that? Yeah, so there's all kinds of, well, let me say, his question is how sustainable, I think, was the question of raising NOI each year. So that, that's the fun part. I don't have the answer to you because there's always a different way to do, there's always a better way to do it, a new way to do it, another innovative approach. So I'll give you an example uh, using somebody, not me, um, that you know of. Jeff Bezos um, is a great example of this. Many years ago, um, he has been known to be neurotic about dollars. Okay? So many years ago, in all the warehouses at Amazon, he removed all the light bulbs out of vending machines. Right? How rude, right? His thought is, do you really need a light? Anything in there will kill you, so just pick one, right? So do you really, teasing, but do you really need a light? No. There's a cost of the bulb. There's a cost of the man hours to replace the bulb. And what's the utility of them, and how much do you really need to see the place it's lit? So what he found is, and I'm going off of memory, but I think Amazon was able to reduce their cost, so consider it growing in a lie by reducing their cost, uh, by roughly $3 million a year by not replacing light bulbs and bidding machines. Okay, now, if, if Amazon is traded at 30 times earnings, which it's not, okay, but if it was, it's, it's more than that, but if it was at 30 times earnings and you just grew earnings by $3 million by removing light bulbs, you just traded roughly $100 million of shareholder value because of those bloody little light bulbs. So you go from saying, what the heck, what's your neurotic, what's the big deal, to saying, oh, it's a big deal, right? Because it's value to you. So the point is there's always a different way. There's also there's always a way to save. There's also always a way to grow. Um, I can't answer the question because it presumes that I know the playing field, and there's always a, another line to be drawn. There's always something else you can do. Uh, that's the fun part for us is finding new ways to do things, and every day we try. Um, I will say we have not to, to date hit a limit where we, we've really said, man, we can't find a single way to take this asset to better over time. You know, we've hit, we've hit the max uh, constraint on growth. We haven't found that yet, uh, which is good. Uh, any other questions on this that may be informative or helpful? Okay, we'll, we'll move on. And if, if, if one pops up, we'll come back to it in just a little bit. All right, so we went through um, this. So for us, we want to target businesses with NOI growth. Why do you think we want to do that? Well, given the goal, the end in mind, wouldn't you want to target businesses that give you a chance to grow in a while over time? I mean, I think that would be the next logical step for us would be target those businesses. Okay, so this is a chart. I took this off of a public filing. This is from Sun Communities, their investor presentation. You can grab it. It's public. Uh, but in short, this is NOI growth over the last 20 years by industry or by asset class within real estate. I know a lot of people are very familiar with apartments. Okay, Apartments are third a very distant third in terms of NOI growth. Number one and number two are mobile home parks and manufactured housing. And I'll go through this really quickly. So what this basically says is, okay, from 2000 to present, which type of asset classes have generally performed the best from an NOI growth perspective over a very long period of time? And the two best are, like I said, mobile home parks and storage. But what they're doing is they start base year 2000 with $100 of NOI, assuming all properties in the entire universe for that asset class is $100 a month of NOI. It then tracks the NOI growth over time. The reason why this is important is you can't grow NOI by acquisition. This is not an acquisitive model. This is a, a same store model. So in short, when you go from start to finish, $225, what was $100 of NOI on average 20 years ago is now $225 of NOI on average for self storage. This is the industry at large. So are there some that went more than that, higher than that? Are there others that went under? But the average is from 100 to 225. Now, if you guys are really bored tonight and you want to play around with this, take $125 of increased NOI, annualize that, right? Annualize that, and then times it by however many units you plan on owning one day, and then capitalize it for value. And that is what, on average, the people have done in these industries. So self storage, 225, manufactured housing, 219. So it's a close second to first. Third is multifamily at $158. Okay. Now, if I, I say this all the time. There's nothing wrong with apartments at, at all. If you were to tell me I can't invest in self storage in mobile home parks, well, then I do apartments. That doesn't mean it's, it's bad. I just, for me, I want to invest in things that give me the best shot at creating the right kind of dollars. 
That's that's a simple it is. It's not personal, it's not emotional, that's just that's that's just me. Um, so anyway, you, you can go down malls 146, shopping centers 140, industrial 140, office 132, and then there's a, a list of others that fall down below that. This is really compelling, I think. So question. If you buy an asset, if you invest in an asset of any of any type this quarter, do you want your income to be more or less than last quarter? Yes. More, yes. And how many quarters in a row would you want that to be? <laughs> when would you want that to stop? Right? So well, I, I, I ask these questions, and some people are like, these are really stupid, simple questions. But I see people doing things that are at odds with what they think is stupid, simple. So I'll, I'll start by saying this. So a couple of things. So back, this is about the last 20 years, this chart. Very simple chart. This is from Green Street Advisors um, from 2016. I was not able for this to find a more updated version, although I believe it's still uh, really pretty much the same. I know I'm manufactured how it is. All right, so here's what it finds. From 1998 to present, the average NOI growth rate from 98 to this point, the end of 2015, the average NOI growth rate for manufactured housing was 4.2% per year. So going back to the gentleman's question, if I have a $500 a month lot rent and my average growth rate is 4.2%, what's 4.2% on $500? More than $20. That's why I actually use the $20 example, because on average, that's what it's produced. So that $4.8 million on 1,000 units, that's not pushing the bounds. That's just taking the average. Okay? Now, here, so 4.2% has been the average. Now, if there is a recession, how would you want your business? How, how impaired do you want your business? Here, right, as little as possible. So that's low correlation, it's called low beta. Uh, there's a lot of ways you can research beta. If you find publicly traded companies that invest in a specific space on Google Finance, it'll actually say the beta rating. Um, and beta ratings indicate how correlated that investment is to the broader market. Um, but in short, in 2008 to 2010, manufactured housing, the growth, the, red, uh, the NOI growth rate went from 4.2 to 3.1. Still positive. In 2002 to 2004, it went to 3%. So was it impaired? Yes. But was it impaired to the negative? Did it fall negative? No. So let's look at apartments. In 2002 to 4, it went negative 3.2. In 2008 to 2010, it went negative 1. Average is 2.9. How many quarters of negative growth between oh, uh, 98 and 15, how many quarters of negative growth? Manufactured housing have had zero. Back to what I asked a second ago, how many do you want? You said zero. Manufactured housing has had zero. Apartments have had 19 quarters where that quarter finished lower than the prior quarter. 19 times and roughly, uh, call it 18 years. Okay. Mall, seven. Industrial 16, office 24, re industry at large 14. So this kind of gives you an indication of what we're, we're talking about. This is a projection. This is also from Green Street Advisors. Um, the projection for the next, um, or for the foreseeable future, is manufactured housing um, to be the best for the purpose of NOI growth. Number two, and I, I say number two, for those of you who are very detailed, you'll say that's not two, that's three. It's tied for a second with, um, with healthcare. Now, the reason we don't do healthcare, meaning um, assisted living facilities, memory care, we've looked at them. The difference is this. Um, when you own a mobile home park, it's a, it's a real estate play. Okay, it's a real estate play. How many people uh, do you need for a 300-unit for a mobile home park? How many employees do you need? One. For a storage facility, how many do you need? One. For an assisted living facility, how many do you need? It, it, it's a, approximately all things equal, as best as I can find as a comparison, about 60. So it's much less of a real estate play. It's a lot more of an operating company with a real estate component. We don't invest in operating companies. We, we're in a real estate business. Um, so that's why number two is not an option for us, although it is tied. So number one and number two, uh, the projections are that they will remain the same. This is also an interesting stat called CapEx. The question, uh, said another way, how much money, if you own a piece of real estate of any type, how much money would you like to spend each year to keep your customers coming back? More or less. 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 So you notice these gems, these all these gems popping up. I, I've seen some recent data that says, and it, it varies, that anywhere between 30 and 50 percent of the revenue that they receive is actually spent on finding another you. 30 to 50 percent. That's crazy. That's a lot. So the two lowest in real estate is 3.6 percent for manufactured housing. 
self storage is 4.7, the average for real estate is 8.1. So not only is it, it looks to be fairly, fairly durable in terms of the growth rate, it's moated, you don't have to spend a lot to attract new customers or to keep them, uh, all the things that I want. And why would that be important? If I have to spend another dollar to attract a new customer, that's one less dollar on NOI. I want every single dollar that I can find. Um, so why mobile home parks, constrained supply? I'm gonna kind of transition into a little bit more on the asset classes specifically, and then we're gonna go to lunch here in a second. So number one, constrained supply. So there's about 50,000 mobile home parks in the United States. Uh, approximately 95% of them are mom and pop, uh, meaning they're owned by sons and daughters or the original owners, but they're mom and pop. They're not managed professionally. Um, this is changing quite quickly in the manufactured housing space. A lot of the big players, the Car Carlisle Group, TPG, Fort, uh, Fortress, um, Virtus, Medley, um, gosh, Blackstone is buying a bunch. So the point is a lot of the institutional capital is rolling in, so there is a march towards what we believe to be consolidation. Now, question, if, if that continues, if bigger and bigger players continue to deploy more and more capital in the space, what happens to cap rates? What happens to the value of my dollar? I like that, All right? So um, just going back to that as a baseline. So constrained supply. Demand, um, I, I don't need to go much into this, but I'll just say one in eight, one in eight Americans, this surprises people. I, I gave a talk in New York, um, New York City about uh, a couple months ago to a, a high net worth group who wanted to learn more about what we do. And it was interesting that they didn't realize how many Americans live in a mobile home. Do you know it's one out of every, roughly one out of every eight Americans lives in a mobile home? <laughs> roughly, in terms of housing units, it's much more common than you imagine, but when you live in the the urban environment, you think it's an anomaly, but when you go out to middle America, it's actually an anomaly. What you see every day is the anomaly, okay? So in short, I'll, I'll give you a couple of things. As of the last census, roughly 50% of, of Americans make 30, roughly $30,000 a year or less. Okay, so what's a standard budget? 30% towards housing, right? So if you make 30,000 a year, that's 9,000 a month, or roughly 700, I'm sorry, 9,000 a year for budgeted towards housing, that's roughly $750 a month. Right. How many how many places do you think are available of quality for 750 a month on average nationwide? Mm -hmm. And our average rent right now is between three and four hundred dollars depending on the property. So not only do we offer a house that you can own yourself, three bedroom, two bath house, okay, that costs about thirty bucks a square foot. Mm -hmm. The average cost for a brand new mobile home about thirty bucks a square foot. But you own the house. It's a three two. It's about twelve hundred square feet. You're the owner of. Okay, you pull up, you have a driveway, you're 10 steps to your front door, you have a play, you know, a playground or a yard that your kids can play on, there's no neighbors left, right, top, bottom. It's, it's a really quality environment uh, that, can, that can do a lot of good. So demand is rising, uh, there's many financing options. Um, just quickly here, uh, more recently, I don't know if you've been following it, but Congress has been pretty much yelling for years at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to do something about the affordability crisis. So now, as a park owner, I can go and buy a mobile home park and obtain financing from the GSEs, so both Fannie and Freddie, it's called agency debt. What's even better is I can go to both Fannie and Freddie and have them compete for my business. They actually compete with each other for me and they're both government entities. It's unbelievably wonderful. So the, the point is the quality of the debt is actually really helpful too. So today, depending on the size of the deal, the quality of the deal, the underwriting on the deal, um, you could obtain anywhere between, call it 70% financing LTV. It's a little higher than we generally go. Um, it's usually 30 year AM, 10 year fixed. But here's the kicker. How many of you are familiar with CMBS debt? CMBS, commercial mortgage backed securities. All right, so here's, here's a quick little, I'm not going long into this, but I'll, I'll make a mention. You have to really mind your debt, the type of debt you put on projects. And here's why. So this dollar talk that we had, right? So let's say you buy a property and you add a lot of dollars. Great. Now what do you want to do? You want to convert those dollars to something that's in your pocket that's usable? Well, the problem is if you went and obtained CMBS debt, commercial mortgage-backed security, uh, CMBS debt, there's defeasance, there's real maintenance. Basically, your equity is locked up and unaccessible because of the type of debt. So now you have value, you just can't touch the value because you obtain debt that restricts your access to the value. 
So not, not only now do I know I want to create value and how to create value, but do I also want to obtain debt that allows me to access that? Yes. So with agency financing, one of the differences is for the first five years, if you get a loan, an agency loan, for the first five years, you can refinance the project twice with no yield maintenance, no defeasance, no penalty, uh, which is unbelievable. So if you buy a property, the interest rate is generally in the fours today on a mobile home park uh, in the fours. So if you're buying a six or seven cap rate or a five cap, even at a five, if you're paying four for debt and you're obtaining 5% cap rate, are you positive leverage? Are you earning more than you're paying? Yeah. Believe it or not, there's a lot of people today buying properties at below. They're, they're buying a three cap and they're paying four for debt. They're, they're, they're losing money from the opportunity of maybe making money. It's, it's pretty interesting. So, Anyway, um, so there's a lot of financing options. The industry is consolidating, which I said. So I wanted to show a quick video. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I just wanted to give you a visual of what a mobile home park looks like, because I do realize most people have preconceived notions. This is one of the mobile home parks we own in the Fund 7. Um, it's nice. I mean, would you, run that, would you run out of that screaming? That's a mobile home park. <laughs> this one is in North Dakota. Why not North Dakota? Because there's an Air Force base right up the road. Good market. We like it. We own about 400 units there. So, is that the worst thing you've ever seen? No, it's much nicer than you'd imagine. That is a mobile home park. So, when you see it, when you hear about it, that, that's not a response. I talk, I've talked about the value of the dollar and the video of the mobile home park. And I, I was started with that. <laughs> so, so anyway, so quickly on storage, and by the way, just to uh, let your appetite, there's a video on the storage facility. <laughs> Alright, so why sell storage? Um, we like storage, so let me give you a pro and a con, I'll even, I'll even devil's advocate the two. Mobile home parks are good in ways that storage, self storage may not be always, and the opposite is also true. So let me give you an example. So we're looking at a mobile home park right now that the in the market we're looking at, we think the average market rent would be roughly $700 or could be $700 a month uh, per space. It's a nice market, good market. Uh, that number wouldn't surprise you if you were to learn of it. Um, the park currently charges about $500 a month in lot rent. Okay, so is, do I have reason to believe that there's a pathway over a very long time to increase revenues? Yes. Now, am I going to go in day one and raise the, the customer's rent? No, of course not. But the point is, over time, could I maybe $20 at a time or incrementally over time? Yeah, I think I can. Now, interestingly enough, on storage, we don't even have to have that conversation. If the same was true, I'm just talking apples to apples, um, let's say the same is true, let's say a unit is $700 a month and the subject property is 500 with storage, guess what I can do day one? I can raise it to 700 if it's market, right? If it's market, and that's the question, is it market? If it's not, a ton of people will leave. If it is, a lot of people will stay because they'll pay the same everywhere else and they'll have to move to pay the same, which makes some sense which is why they stay. So the point is, with storage, you can actually tighten, tighten the NOI and grow the NOI much, on a much more accelerated basis than manufactured housing. And you'll see this borne out in the details historically Self-storage has more of an elastic growth. So I'll, I'll give you an example. If, I, if you were to ask me what, you sh what I would have rather owned in 2008 to 2010, I would have said uh, manufactured housing. It was really steady, it grew, our revenues grew. It was great. Storage didn't do that at all, but if I had to pick one, I would have picked mobile home parks. But if you would have said, okay, well what about since 2010, I would have rather owned storage. So storage has more elastic, um, response to the market. Uh, the, the NOI grows in a more explosive manner um, than manufactured housing. But manufactured housing is more steady, eddy, consistent, it's more of a stable backbone. So we actually like creating vehicles that own both types of assets in the vehicle so you get a blended benefit across them, which is which is what we do. So month to month leases, so here's the here's the thing. So right now in fund seven we have about seventy five hundred units in storage that the fund owns. So 7,500, right? We just talked about the value of a dollar across a thousand units, right? So we have about 7,500 units in the fund. How many of you think next month I can raise rent five dollars a month across the entire portfolio and not have a lot of brain damage? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, five dollars a month times 7,500. 
lot. It's a lot. But I mean, how amazing of a business! I, 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 I'm not kidding you. I still to this day marvel over the simplicity and the power of, of knowing what we're doing and how we're doing it. It's pretty. It's, it's really fun. Average tenancy. This is an interesting one. Um, the way we do storage, everybody has their own implementation, their own way of doing it. This is higher than normal. But our average tenancy is roughly 2.7 years. The average tenant stays for about 995 days, uh, which is a long term. You hear people all the time. I was in a storage facility we owned in Austin, Texas recently, and a guy was in the lobby and he said, I'm, just, I'm using this for two months. And then we just walked out and them, because it'll, on average, will be there for 2.7 years. So um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's true. How many of you have storage now? How many of you want to move this week? <laughs> no, no, it's, it's just, you don't want to move. It, becomes, it, becomes, it starts as a convenience and over time becomes a necessity. There's very attractive leverage. There's room to raise rents. The other thing to know is storage the way we do it. We have about 30 to 40 percent of our customers are actually commercial or other businesses that utilize our, our storage. Um, so here's a storage facility. We built this one from the ground up. Uh, this one is in a suburb of Denver uh, called Parker. Uh, we opened this one about a year ago, and this one's now roughly 57 percent occupied. Uh, it should be uh, pretty much stabilized in the next year or two. But you can, you can kind of see the condition and quality. Uh, our standard is Disneyland clean. Uh, that's our communicated standard. So anyway, that's that one. Still, not, nothing compared to the mobile home park. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I will say, if you want to, <laughs> if you really want to see these videos, on our website, we have all the videos of all the properties. You can just sit there and watch them. <laughs> um, so a couple of things, and let me see how much time do I have. What's the website? Oh, okay. <laughs> I was kidding. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so I'll give you, while I'm doing it, I'll give you a couple of resources. So there's a, um, a recorded talk that I, we, we do a, a webinar once a year for all of our, the people who um, are a part of our company. And so I did one a couple of months ago and recorded it. So that website is elevationwebinar.com and it'll take you automatically to a replay. It's about an hour, it has to do with a lot of this if you want to hear any parts of this again. So it's elevationwebinar.com. Um, the second thing for the videos, if you go to elevationfund.com slash acquisitions, uh, plural. So elevationfund.com slash acquisitions. That's where you'll be able to pull up all the videos that are um, owned in the fund, or properties that are owned by the fund. There's, uh, there's a number, there's 19 properties that are currently owned uh, by the fund. Um, I'm trying to think of other uh, resources I can give you guys. Um, so in terms of our, our strategy, and, and if you don't mind, how much time do I have before lunch? Do I have? <laughs> I'm not used to hearing that. <laughs> Okay, perfect. I've got enough time for this. So, um, thank you for that, by the way. Um, and I'll also say, I don't know if any of you have ever put together events. Um, this is really a labor of love, and I would just say, well done. This is, this is not easily done. Um, the whole team has been wonderful. So, in terms of our strategy, so here's, here's the question. I see a lot of times people buy properties, and they fix them up. Um, what, what you'll see a lot of people today is, is they'll say, okay, well, in the last five years, we've made X dollars. What you'll find if you dig is in many cases, they didn't make X dollars because they grew in a Y. They made X dollars because the cap rate went from 10 to 5, called cap rate compression. So basically, the dollar that they bought was worth twice as much. And now, by the way, that's all fine and well. That's great. But if you had to pick one, market timing or operational ex excellence and execution, which one would you pick? Uh, yes. The second one, because this one I can control. This one, I'm at the whim of whatever the market gives me. Okay, so the, the reason I say that is this, um, a couple of things, I'm trying to think the best way to, this is a dynamic um, conversation, um, but in short, so let's start by this, um, if I buy a property, and let's say um, you invest 100000 I'm just using 100000 as a base consideration, most people going back to cash flow, okay, so going back to this cash flow concept, most people will say, well, what kind of rate of return can I earn on my money? And we may say uh, 7, 8, 9, 10%, depending on the, the, the vehicle and the time. But the point is, the next question people say is, well, as you're growing your income, shouldn't my distribution grow? Wouldn't that make sense? If the business is making more, we're all making more. And the answer is yes. But interestingly enough, there's a point where cash flow becomes bad. 
and in real, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain this. So, we all know depreciation, right? We all know the benefit of depreciation. Yeah, for the tax benefit. So in real estate, if you're generating income from real estate and there's depreciation offsets, in some cases you may pay little to no tax on the income you're receiving because you're, you're depreciating it. Your tax basis is going down. You may have recapture in the future, but in that year, you pay no tax, okay? So the point in that is, let's say the first 8% of income that you receive from an investment is offset by depreciation. Okay, so if the first 8% is offset, if you make 8%, how much tax do you pay? Zero. If you make nine, you pay tax on one. In 10, you pay tax on two. So do you, do you start to see the more you make, it starts becoming increasingly tax inefficient. Okay? And, and I know some of you are fighting because you're like, yeah, but I want more, you know? <laughs> and you're so conflicted because that's that's where your goal lies, is, is on that more side. So, and, and that's nothing wrong with that. But do you understand how that becomes tax inefficient, okay? So that's one thing to understand. The other thing to understand is if you put in $100,000 into an investment and we find, in a, we find dollars and we grow NOI and the value of the investment goes up to the point where your 100 is now worth two, you're earning a return on your original 100, but you're not earning a return on your current two. So the point is your return on investment is fine. Your return on present equity is getting incredibly terrible. Does that make sense? We're a victim of our success. So our whole model is, is very simple. At or around the time of, usually it's about the first five years of owning an asset. We buy an asset, we tighten the screws, we grow NOI. At or around year five, return on equity is falling, which is kind of a result of a good thing. The value is going up, so that's kind of a good thing, but kind of a bad thing. Okay, so that's, that's going down. You're also starting to potentially rise above, your cash distributions are rising above your depreciation offsets, which is also a bad thing, good thing, but bad thing. So to cure it, what we do is we go to a bank, we refinance the property, take the equity out, distribute it to members and investors, which is tax-free, right? We now have to pay the debt, which reduces our distribution back under the coverage of depreciation offset. So you pay no tax to go back to paying no tax. Yeah. And now you have a portion of capital that has been returned to you, so now you can reinvest that and increase your ROE back to your ROI. Do you buy if you want to. You can go to Tahiti, I, I, and this is not what you're saying. <laughs> I'm not saying that, that, but the point is, assuming that you invest into something else, you're now compounding your growth. You started with one income stream, now you have two, and you're compounding. Um, which is which is really great. Now, I want to give you a vision for this because I, I think it's, it's important. So, assuming all this works like I'm describing, and let's say at year five, all of your capital is back. All right, you put in 100 at, at year five, let's say all 100 is now returned to you, not including the income you receive. Okay. Now, with real estate, when you invest in something like what we do, you're an owner. This is not a loan. So, it, it, sometimes people think of it as a loan, and it's not. Because when a loan is paid off, do I still have to pay you? No. No, but if you're an owner and you have equity in something, if your money is returned, do you still own it? Yes. Yes. So the point is, not only do we accomplish the things we just described, but in years six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, continue to get monthly distributions of income. So on a cash on cash return perspective, what's your cash on cash return in year six? Assuming all capital is returned. Infinite. Infinite. Right? Now, the interesting irony of this is at year 10, so let's fast track to year 10, okay? And, and the reason I, and let me tell you what I've learned in all of this, usually investors start with a focus on cash flow, right? That's why I'm speaking to this, is most people start wanting cash flow. And to just be blunt, um, the reason why in most cases, anytime somebody invests with somebody else, 100% of people wonder if they just put their money into a scam. And so every distribution you receive, it's less likely that they are the people you worry they might be. Yeah. Right? I, I just call them a spade a spade. Okay? So the point is, though, what if you're wrong in the, when the investment is actually legitimate? Well, what interestingly enough happens is investors typically start with an interest towards cash flow, but once they realize the cash flow is good and the business is legitimate, when you then at year 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 say, okay, so what do you think? Let's sell these properties and get rid of them. What do you think? So you sell the properties. What happens to the income? It stops. What happens to the what happens to the gain? You pay tax on it. 
And, and some people say, yeah, but I can take that and reinvest it. Yeah, but like one of the things that, that sometimes people don't realize is even if you were to reinvest it into something that produced the same, your risk-adjusted return would be less. Because owning an asset for seven, eight, nine, ten years is far more de-risked than an asset that you're buying day one. So on a risk-adjusted basis, it's not even close. So the point is, what we focus on is churning capital, not assets. What I mean by that is we create vehicles doing exactly what we're talking about, where we refinance, return capital, and then at year 10, shoot and aim to give investors the option to exchange out of them into another vehicle to further basis, but stay with, um, stay with the assets they've been with sometime. In short, at the end of 10 years, if you like it and want another 10 years, give you the choice of doing that. Or if you want to go to Tahiti, I keep pointing at you, you never said that. <laughs> um, you can go to Tahiti or both um, in, in giving people the flexibility over time. Uh, but that's that's kind of the way we look at things and add value. We talked about all that. So it, it's going back to this. So if in 2007, this is the same chart I showed earlier, should we have sold here? Should we have sold here? 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 See the point? I'll, I'll use an example, um, one last uh, story. So I was um, asked to speak at an event years ago, and the guy before me was, um, <laughs> if you don't know well, but Ben Stein, right? Mueller, and you know, Mueller, you, I said you were um, culturally relevant. Um, so anyway, the, <laughs> thank you. Um, I found that humorous. Um, but, but in short, Ben was telling a story um, of a property he bought, and, um, and this was backstage, we were chit-chatting about this, and he told me, he's like, you know, worst deal I ever did was selling a property in Beverly Hills. I bought it for 300000 He's like, I got offered $1.5 million. I thought the guy was a, and he, you know, he just said he thought the guy was not that bright for wanting to pay one point five. He's like, that house today is worth $8 million. He's like, I thought this guy was not too bright. Turns out that guy was me. Um, but that goes back to this, to this chart. So a couple of other things, and then we're going to go to lunch. I'm just going to follow up. Um, yeah, fo focus. So this is kind of what we're doing. You, you know about that. Um, yeah, we've already talked about that. This is for those of you who are interested in learning more about what we do and participating in some degree, no obligation. Um, this is currently where Fund 7 owns property in. So this is currently the assets. So I said 7,500 units, roughly 7,841. That's not really rough, it's pretty specific. Uh, but those are the properties that are owned. The video that you saw, one of the properties was here, the other one was here, the storage was here, the mobile home park was here. Um, so we own all over the place, we'll continue to grow. If you um, want more information, I already gave this to you, elevationfund.com. If you want to watch a webinar that I did recently, it's elevationwebinar.com. Um, this is our phone number, 800-257-1254, email, and then we're readily accessible. So if you have questions, and I will say this as a final follow-up, I'm consistently surprised. Um, about a month, uh, month and a half ago, I was in San Antonio looking at a mobile home park, and I was at uh, Papacitos. Here's a Papacitos north of San Antonio. I was sitting there eating, and I, I had my logo on my shirt, and the guy said, are you, a, are you an entrepreneur? I said, yes. He's like, man, I've always wanted to be on an entrepreneur, be an entrepreneur. I'm a hard worker. I do all of this stuff. I, I'm sleeping on a mattress in my mom's house. I've got a little boy. I'm working hard. And it was awesome. I and mean, the kid just had, he seemed to have all the get up and go. And by the way, this story isn't to say that he doesn't. I just, I'm continually surprised by this. But, um, but we talked. I said, love to help you. Uh, I, love, I love people who are doing something and want to kind of have that, that um, we, we call it fire in the belly. Yeah, it's one, the one thing you can never teach into your kids is fire in the belly. Uh, that's what we're trying to figure out how to teach in the mind. Uh, but in short, he had fire in the belly, and so I gave him my, my card, I gave him my personal cell phone number, I said, please reach out. Um, I will tell you, I, I do that probably a hundred times a year, and guess how many people actually reach out? Zero. About, I actually tracked it, it's about 1%. I, I kid you not, about 1%. So I, I say this to say, I, and I'm not the only one here, I think you realize every single person here who's speaking actually wants to offer something of value or why, why get on the plane. So in short, we'd love, love to help you. I hope you take this information and absolutely kill it. I hope one day I'm sitting at a conference learning from you, telling me all the things that you did and how you made it much better than what I told you. So um, here's to that. Thanks for coming. We are gonna go to lunch, hooray. Um, I will leave the video of Mobile Home Park plan. <laughs> <laughs>